Good evening. We welcome everyone back to our services this evening. Hope everyone had a good afternoon. By number 743, number 743, we'll begin our worship this evening. After we sing this song, uh, Kenneth Whittemore will lead us in our opening prayer. And then we'll begin with Greg on my left and sing around for a few moments uh, before we have the lesson of the evening. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we're again so thankful for this another day that we've had to live and enjoy the things of this earth. We thank you at this time for the so many blessings that you give us each and every day of our lives. We thank you for this good congregation here at Double Springs. We thank you for the members and all the good things they're involved in and the efforts that's put forth in this community. We thank you for Vance and Justin and their families. We especially thank you for our eldership. We ask you to continue to be with each and every one of us as we go through our daily walks of life that we strive to do the things that are right. We thank you so much for the progress that's been made through the vaccines and the progress through the COVID. We continue to pray for those that have been greatly effective and those affected and those that have lost the loved ones. We especially pray for those of this congregation that have recently lost their loved ones. At this time, we pray for the Sims family and that... Uh, 
passing of Miss Patsy, and she was so well known in this congregation and loved by so many. We ask you to continue to be with us as we go through this service, that we are able to put all the worldly things from our mind and give the speaker our attention and use those things in our daily walks of life. We thank you for your son and that sacrifice that he made on that cross and the love that it took and the love that you have for us. We ask you now, let's be with us as we sing these songs of praise to thee. All this we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing the first and the last verse. <clears throat> My Savior did my love feel I
Let's get our song books and look at 351 with me. Let's sing 351. And then after this, we'll begin our lesson. 351. <laughs> to our area Bible Bowl. That was one that was led, seemed like every Monday. We met, well, third Monday's right, I think it was third Monday's. We didn't sing that much at, at Winfield and growing up, so I always look forward to Bible Bowl. So there are certain songs, when I hear them, my mind automatically goes to third Monday nights at Burleson or Winfield or here or wherever that may have been. And that song is one of them. I can remember... The first time I realized that Jesus is coming soon. Uh, we were attending, at the time, the Guin Church of Christ. Brother Don Williams was the preacher there. And uh, Brother Bill Rayburn, some of you know Brother Bill, he was one of the elders. He and Don uh, came to our home and showed my dad Jewel Miller film strips. Uh, the actual film strips, not the cassette tape. And I can remember sitting there wondering what the word antediluvian meant having no idea. If you remember those film strips, you know what I'm talking about. And hearing that boop and hearing that click, you know. And it wasn't long after that my dad obeyed the gospel. But we had a gospel meeting with a man named Haskell Sparks. And some of you remember that guy. He's no longer a part of the Lord's Church. Um, he has gone into denominationalism and preaching. That's a very dynamic preacher. And I can remember for the first time in my life, I was about seven years old, listening to every word that came out of the preacher's mouth. And I remember my dad actually made the comment, riding back, we lived in Winfield, because we, so driving back to home, my dad was really impressed, my mom was really impressed with him, and he said, that's the first time I've ever seen Justin not a draw during the middle of church, or make an airplane out of the church bulletin. And I remember walking out of that church building at Gu, and it walked down the steps and go out the back. It's got a, a long concrete walkway going out of the car. And we had a 1985 Chrysler New Yorker. I liked that car because it talked to you. And uh, uh, Frank, you may remember those cars that tell you your door is ajar. And I uh, didn't really know what that meant when you were little. That kind of confusing. Um, and so I remember looking up at the sky and thinking, he's really coming back. And I, that, that just, when you're that age and you kind of thought your future was secure and, and everything was kind of going on this little timeline in your mind how things should go, you live, you die, and you go to heaven. And that's just the way things are. You know, some people are still very ignorant about the second coming of Jesus Christ, like I was when I was seven years old. And so when you look at the Bible especially the letters of First and Second Thessalonians. We began a series of studies back in the fall. We're not completed that. I wanted to get through our series on um, decisions uh, based upon some things we were doing in our Zoom class on Sunday night, so we're coming back to this. 
and walking through these letters and learning some things about, especially about the second coming of Jesus. This morning I said if you want to learn about spiritual growth, you read the short epistle to 2 Peter. There's much in that letter about spiritual growth. If you want to learn about the second coming of Jesus, you read First and Second Thessalonians. One commentator I read, and I've not done the work to, to count this, so I'm going to have to trust what he said. He said in First and Second Thessalonians, the second coming of Jesus is mentioned one every five verses. And so Paul talks to them a great deal about the preparation one must have, echoing the words of our Savior. So as we begin our study, let's begin in verse 13, and notice the principle that, that Paul taught, but not only Paul taught this principle, but Jesus taught it as well. If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, it says, But we do not want you to be uninformed brothers. Of course, the joke's told, and Vance has told it a few times about uh, the lady at Freed Harbin lectures that wasn't married, and she was all up in age, and and most versions that says, I don't want you to, I won't have you ignorant brethren. You know, that's where her biblical mandate for staying single all her life came from was in this passage. And, uh, of course, jokingly uh, mentioning this verse. But think about the idea of being uninformed about the second coming of Jesus. What if you didn't know about that? Each one of us sit and stand in a position of being informed. Somebody, whether it be a Bible class teacher uh, a, a minister, a fellow Christian, they've taken time for you to say, All right, Jesus died on a cross for you, and he's coming to judge the world. And, and that's the most vital information that you can know because accountability is coming. Several passages such as Romans chapter 14, verses 13, really through the end of that chapter, every person will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, for we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 9 says, and we make it our aim to please the Lord. Why? Verse 10, we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. So as we study this text, one thing we're going to notice, it seems that they were concerned about those who, who had passed on since Paul's visit with them. Had they missed the second coming of Jesus, what would that be like? And so when it comes to our understanding of this, there's much false doctrine about the second coming of Jesus. The teenagers and I right now on Sunday morning, we're studying Revelation. I've, I've been through Revelation, I guess, with every group. Uh, that book, To the Overcomers by Andy Kaiser. It's a little class book. I've used that book five or six times since I've been here. I love teaching teenagers about Revelation because it's a powerful message. Some people will go there and, and camp out and come up with some doctrines that are foreign to Scripture. So I want you to be uninformed not only for accountability but also for accuracy. What does the Bible actually teach about those who have died? What about those who are still alive in the second coming of Jesus? Jesus himself taught about the second coming uh, that would come at a later time. Let's leave our ribbon markers here in 1 Thessalonians 4. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. I want you to notice toward the end of his ministry, not only did he prepare his disciples about his impending death and resurrection, but he talked to them about judgment to come. We don't like to think about judgment, do we? Uh, you think about small illustrations of judgment in our life. Right now, if you go in parts of Walker County, there is a speed sign. And when you get within five miles an hour of the speed limit, it turns blue. The blue lights come on. What do you do when you see blue lights out of the corner of your eye, knowing it's not even a police officer? What, what's, what's your reaction? You hit on the brake. And it works, because it worked on me yesterday when I was driving to Union Chapel for a baseball game. I knew I wasn't speeding, but when those blue lights, those blue lights are judgment, <laughs> that's coming. Well, you put on a break. Think about when the teacher's in the room. You got Some of you are educators, retired educators. Uh, think about the difference between when you were there and when a substitute was there. Substitute teachers. There are two teachers that I have my greatest respect. Number one, ag teachers. Brother Terry is an ag teacher. If you're willing to give a teenager a blowtorch, you are a brave individual. 
okay, number one. Number two are substitute teachers. I substituted some here at Winston County, and Bart, I substituted, he always had a good class, and I substituted the tech center in middle school. But after a while, I was like, that's for the birds. <laughs> you know, I love to go, I find other ways to go over to the school, because I remember what I, when a substitute teacher walked out, how I viewed that, you know, and so I don't want to be that person. <laughs> but you think about accountability. When that teacher walks in the room, when you don't think your parent is looking, or, or whatever it may be, little illustration of judgment. It demands some preparation. So Jesus does not want his disciples and us to be uninformed about judgment is coming. So you here in Matthew 24, here they are outside the temple. And the disciples ask him two questions. Look at verse 3. And as we sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when these things will be, and what will be the sign of your coming at the close of the age. So in context, Jesus has standing and leaving the temple, verse 1, he says, And Jesus left the temple, going away with his disciples, and came to a point to him to show the buildings of the temple. But he answered, You see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. They were very proud of the temple. This is at least the third time the temple had been rebuilt. This is not Solomon's temple. This is Herod's temple. And it was destroyed in, when the Babylonians came. It was destroyed in the intertestamental period and destroyed again by the Romans. So this is at least the third time this thing's been rebuilt. So they say, Jesus, look at this. Look at this magnificent building. He says, this building is going to be destroyed. So they pull him aside. What do you mean the temple is going to be destroyed? You remember what the temple represented to the Israelites? Tabernacle, same thing. What did that represent? God's presence. Having the temple there meant God is with them, and you're telling me that it's going to be destroyed. What they didn't recognize, God was with them in the form of Jesus Christ. He's standing there right in front of them. So they ask him two questions. The first time thing Jesus addressed is the destruction of Jerusalem, and that's from verse 3. And look at verse 34. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. You see that? These things, these things. It kind of brackets the discussion. But look at verse 36. But concerning that day, now verse 36 is where he begins to answer the second question. But concerning that day, no one knows the hour. And beginning at verse 36 and going all the way through chapter 25, Jesus talks about preparation and the reality of judgment. And so Jesus taught us about the second coming of Christ. And so we must be prepared for the Lord's coming. So from our study tonight, I want you to learn one principle. Uh, if you don't learn anything else, learn this. The future coming of the Lord demands biblical, godly decisions today. The future is predicated upon today. No, you can't earn salvation. You're given grace and mercy, but God still expects submission. It goes back to what we talked about this morning. Obeying the gospel, and initially it's submitting to the plan of salvation. But from that day forward, you're obedient to the gospel every day of your life. You're submitting to the teachings and doctrine of Christ. So as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5, we're going to notice four principles that perhaps will be some reminders for you. You've studied this before, I'm sure, uh, in Bible classes. Vance has preached on this, always does an excellent job with that. Maybe some reminders, or maybe some principles maybe you haven't thought of. But as a result of our study tonight, I hope that you'll be better informed about the second coming of Jesus. So as we continue, let's notice number one. Because we have hope, we don't grieve as others do. Let's continue reading here in verse 13. We've read the first part of it. Well, let's just read it all together again. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Have you ever been to a funeral where you knew that person wasn't a Christian in any capacity and the family knew it? Have you ever been to those top funerals? I've heard Vance have done some of those funerals, maybe many. I did a funeral like that one time, uh, more than once actually. Uh, recently, I had a family member. We knew 
we're never going to see him again, hopefully. I hope I don't see him again, just to be honest with you. That's kind of a depressing thought because there was no hope. There was nothing hopeful I could say at that funeral. I remember one time I did a funeral here at Nichols, and I, I met with the family beforehand. Uh, Mr. Diamond had needed somebody to come do one, and it worked out, and I, was, I went up there and did it. And I'll never forget what that family told me. They said, our family member is an was an atheist agnostic. And we want you to do the funeral for us if you don't mind. And I, I had a connection with them through another, another way in town. Sure, I'll be glad to. It was kind of a small affair, you know. And I remember sitting with that family, and I thought as I was preparing for that, what am I going to say to these people? Because there are some people, when it, came, when it comes with grief, yes, there's grief and the loss of a loved one, of course, but they had no hope. A Christian doesn't grieve without hope. I want you to think about the blessing that hope has and, and, and the anchor it provides for our soul. The New Testament teaches hope is an assurance because its foundation is found in the work of Christ. So let's, let's walk through some of these passages in our minds together that we have here on the screens. Think about outside of Christ. Ephesians 2 and verse 12 says there is no hope for people who are outside of Christ. That, that should encourage us and exhort us to make sure that we are evangelistic. We have a message of hope for a lost world that needs it because they're grieving without hope. And if they have Christ, they have hope. Hope is also the end result of biblical faith. Romans chapter 5, you are justified by faith. And he lists several things there. Faith produces character and so forth. And he says, and character in verse 5 produces hope. We also have hope because our future is secure. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19. Paul here is dealing with the subject of the resurrection. It's one of the most sobering passages because if you hope in this life only, well, he says you are to be pitied. Begin reading with me here in verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You ever pitied someone? You felt sorry for them? He says, if it's about this life alone and not the life to come, this is not worth, this is vain, he says earlier in the passage. It's meaningless. Because we have hope, we have an eternal future. So when it comes to things like death, things like the second coming of Jesus, we don't grieve without hope. We have an anchor for the soul. Number two, the second thing we learn in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is that our future is with Christ. Would you like to know what's going to happen tomorrow? Part of me would. You know, there's things I would like to know. Some of you may think tomorrow we're going to get up and we're going to get the kids up. Uh, we're going to get them ready for school. Tiffany's got to be at school by 7.15. I'm going to take Afton and Ben at 7.35, drop them around the circle drive. They're going to get out. Afton's going to protest because she doesn't want to go to school. I did too, to be honest with you, when I was her age. And uh, she's going to get out. Blake's going to wave at me by. I'm going to go through the circle. I'm going to ride to Shelly Blanton's house. I'm going to get Ben out of his car seat. I'm going to walk in. He's not going to say it. We're plopped down. He's not going to, Shelly's going to say hello. Ben's going to look at her like, I've not had my coffee yet. Okay? And I've got to watch the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Give me a minute, okay? And when you're three-year-old, you need a minute, right, Ernie? Right. And so that's, and I'm going to get in my truck, and I'm going to come here. You know, that's, that's generally a morning. But I may get up tomorrow, and not a single thing happens. We may get up to, uh, tomorrow, and something uh, tragic has happened, and none of us go to school. It may not happen because the Lord might return. And if the Lord were to return, would your future be with Christ I want you to notice the, the detail that Paul goes into in verses 15 to 17 in describing our future. Let's begin reading in verse 15. For we declare to you by the word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds 
to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Notice the emphasis on eternity in these verses. Always. We will be with him. Present tense. A, con a continual state of existence and being with Christ. No mention of a thousand year reign. No mention of a tribulation. No mention of, of anything of source regarding dispensationalism. One sweet Christian lady I heard say this one time. How, in the Lord, how is the Lord going to rule from Jerusalem when he never steps foot on the earth again? I never thought about it like that. I thought that's very well said and simply put. Well, so when it comes to the second coming of Jesus, you see this description here in verse 15. But also notice that reunion we, we have hymns about that. That's a beautiful thought. Being with people, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We meet the Lord in the air. And so we look forward to seeing those loved ones. But also eternal life after his coming. I want you to go to heaven. But even more so than that, God wants you to go to heaven. And God wanted you to go to heaven so much that he sent his son to die in your stead. To be resurrected, defeating the power of sin and death. And as a result of that, your future is with Christ. We'd like to plan our future. We had a planning meeting just a minute ago for things this summer regarding youth and their families. If you look at our calendars, I color code my Apple calendar. It looks like a rainbow. All right? And yours does too. Right now we're playing ball, and that's coming to a close. And th but then there's the next thing. We'd like to think about our future. Every Sunday morning, my 403B account sends me an account uh, update. Most time, I don't even open it. This time last year, I did not open it because <laughs> this time last year, it was way down. I'm okay with opening it right now. There are some people, I bet you, they look at that every Sunday. Why? Because that's their future. That's their money. They want to look at that, and they want that future to be secure. They want to make sure their investments are doing whatever investments are supposed to do, grow. We want to know about our kids' future. Well, we've got three. I pray every day that God gives them an honest and good heart, that they may receive the word of the Lord and bear much fruit. And in spite of their dad, they grow up to be men of God. Okay, that's what I pray for them. And Afton, I pray that God uses what ability she has to God's glory. And whatever she can do, I want her to do. That's what we want for our kids. We plan for college. We plan for maybe future marriage. I joked in our Sunday night Zoom class, I've already written the first paragraph of Blake's wedding. He didn't know I was doing his wedding. He don't have a choice. And so I've already written the first paragraph. I probably won't get through it. Same thing for being. We plan our futures. What about your eternal future? Is it with Christ? I always want to be with the Lord, verse 17. Let's look at a third thing. When it comes to the second coming of Jesus, we often think about this discussion of judgment and harshness. I want you to notice two passages in this text where Paul says this is to be an encouragement. Look at verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Look at verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. The teaching of the second coming of Christ should instill a measure of fear in us. I, I grant that, okay? But it also should be an encouragement to know that you have hope and I have hope and we get to be with Jesus forever. In the case of the Thessalonians, they had some people. They died. They'd fallen asleep. What's going to happen to those people that had fallen asleep? Paul says, they're going to be with Jesus and so are you. That's, that's the greatest message I could tell somebody. You're going to be with Christ. It's going to be okay because God has our future secure. I want you to notice a couple of passages in Revelation. Some of these you probably know. Let's go to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. Look at the idea of the lordship of Christ going into the eternal realm. Revelation 11 and 15 says this. And the seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Look at that. Eternal. That's encouraging. Let's go to Revelation 17, 14. The theme verse for the book of Revelation. Revelation 17, 14. 
They will make war on the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. They are those who oppose Christ. And the Lamb will conquer them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And look how you're described. Those who are with him are called, chosen, faithful. That ain't, that's encouraging. We're with Christ because we're called by the gospel, chosen by God, and we strive to be faithful. And so for us, the second coming of Jesus strengthens our faith. And fourthly, the second coming of Jesus demands preparation. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians, and let's read a few verses from chapter 5. And you can read them and understand them plainly. So let's notice and break down what he says. The first thing he says is this. The coming of Christ is unexpected. Let's read verses 2 and 3. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, sudden destruction will come upon them as, pregnant, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. All three of our children, we were not induced. Afton was born, Don, don't know if he remembers this or not, but we were at a Bible Bowl in Hodges. Uh, Meg would have been in the youth group, maybe Elijah, and Tiffany said, you're not staying for cookies. And we were in Hodges, Alabama, and we drove as fast as you can drive from Hodges, Alabama, back to Double Springs. I remember when Blake was born, uh, Tiffany woke me up at 4.30 in the morning and said, we're going to Coleman. I said, yes, ma'am, we're going to Coleman. Ben, all kids, uh, Afton was born on a Monday morning. Ben was born on a Saturday morning. Tiffany woke me up, said, we're going to Coleman, called my dad. And yes, ma'am, we're going to Coleman. I didn't know when the baby was going to be born. Seemed like with Ben, I didn't think he was ever going to get here. You think about how unexpected that is. Now we kind of plan that a little more, I guess. But you think about that illustration of waiting for that child and, and, and the, the excitement and the, and the preparation and the nervousness there is. He said, that's like the coming of the Lord. Think about a thief. A thief doesn't come to your house and says, you're going to be here next Tuesday at 845. No, you got a baseball game. I don't have a baseball game at 845. This is on the Internet, so i got to be careful about what I say. <laughs> no, I'm not going to be here. i got a baseball game. Good, I'll be here then. You okay with that if I rob your house then? Of course a thief doesn't do that, right? It's unexpected. And so we have to make preparation for his coming. Number two, the coming of Christ demands obedient faith. Let's read verses 4 through 8. For you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are children of night or nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do. Let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. It takes preparation, holy living. And this third thing, the second coming of Christ should lead to our salvation. Look at verses 9 and 10. God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. So it takes preparation. So are you prepared for the second coming of Jesus? So we could summarize our study tonight. It is this. The future coming of the Lord demands biblical Godly decisions today. So you see the biblical mandate. The question is, are you subject to it today? Maybe you've not been making godly decisions, or you, some things have affected your faith, and you've studied this, and it's brought encouragement to you. Maybe you've been doing studying. It has nothing to do with anything that was said today. You've been studying on your own, and you think, you know, I need to make some correction based upon that study. Or maybe somebody's encouraged you in different ways, and maybe you'd like the prayers of the church. We'd love to pray for you and help you in any way that we can. The first step in being prepared for the second coming of Jesus is obey the gospel plan of salvation. Maybe you'd like to obey the gospel today. I can think of no better day than May, 7, May 16th, 2021, than to become a Christian and be prepared for the second coming of Christ. And if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, it's his. And it's extended to you now as we stand, as we sing. I am resolved no longer to
Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Justin, for this good lesson. Uh, we've just got to be ready. We know it's going to happen sometime. It could happen any time. But who's us to be ready at all time? Um, please remember uh, Bert, Sims, and Melody, and two daughters, and the rest of Miss Patsy's family. I never did know her all that well. I wasn't privileged to be around her very much. But from what everybody says, I missed a jewel as far as being able to be with her. And uh, her funeral will be on Tuesday, uh, 4 o'clock, will it? At 4 o'clock. Uh, that will be at the, what funeral home was it? Magnolia. Magnolia Funeral Home, uh, right there off of 69 and 82, close to 82, uh, at Northport. Many of you knew Mr. Don died, and uh, he has passed away. And uh, there will be a, memorial service for him, and it'll not be until Sunday, June the 6th. On our sick list, we're certainly praying for Deborah Patterson. Deborah will have surgery at the Women's Center in uh, Huntsville, and that will be on May the 25th. And so you've got about nine days to be praying for her. Hope you'll take advantage of every one of them. Reba Gower will have surgery on June the 3rd, and uh, I'm not sure if that's at Princeton or UAB, uh, she goes to UAB a lot, but I'm not sure which one it is. It'll be in Birmingham. Pam Murphy and Mike Adair are both recovering from surgery, and we're thankful that they're making progress. Um, please continue to remember Libby Sterling uh, in your prayers. Uh, Libby has a difficult road at best. Uh, she struggles with several health issues. Sister Shelby Edwards was not able to be with us this morning, not feeling real well. Uh, please remember... We mentioned this Wednesday night, Rhonda Morrow. Uh, Diane said that she would really appreciate our prayers as Rhonda faces some very important tests this week. Uh, so please be praying for her. Uh, <clears throat> we have a host of people that are battling cancer. Bing Green, Rob Ray, Lisa Tucker, Maddie Bishop, Lloyd Oliver. Uh, privileged last night at camp to see James Dodd. Uh, Vaughn knows James really well. She calls him Jamer. And... Uh, you know, I was at the hospital at Helen Keller Hospital the day he had surgery. And it's been three and a half years ago. I'll never forget the mood of that. Uh, I was there with somebody else and happened to run into some of them and went down to, he was fixing to go into surgery. And the doctors were just very, very negative. And then after the surgery, it was lots of treatments and things. They told him he had two years to live. Well, he has lived three and a half years. And, uh, but he, he looked really weak last night at the benefit dinner. And uh, he told me that the doctor said now that his time is, is about up. But he said, you know, for the last three and a half years, I have had the privilege to spend much of that time with two little great granddaughters. And he said, I'm telling you, it has been wonderful. And he said, if I go tonight, I am ready, and I thank God for the extended time. But please remember James when you pray. Uh, James is from Lynn, isn't that right, Vaughn? And uh, he used to own the Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, place in Hamilton for many years, served on the, uh, the board of directors at Maywood. I've served with him for a long time until his resignation about four years ago. Uh, please remember also Shea Williams and Leanne May and Danny Pinkert, and these also are battling cancer. Please remember Ginger's granddaughter, Hannah Shaw, and uh, Philip's parents are just not well at all. And we have several that are, that are homebound. Uh, Jeff's mother, Catherine Cole, just not doing real well. Janie Baldy was not able to be with us today. Don has been in the home of Terry and Sue Cavender today. And, uh, they're not doing well. Uh, Tim Mulligan, uh, Tim is just not doing real well right now and it just seems like something different is happening each day and uh, please remember Kathy let's not ever forget uh, what she does and what she's trying to do for Tim Christine George over in the nursing home Christine's had some pretty good days this week uh, Lavonia Walker don't forget Lavonia uh, Lavonia is a few hundred miles from here but it would just be a great great thing to occasionally drop her a card you can't hardly hear her on the phone. Uh, you can't hardly read her writing if she writes you. But you can send her a card, and you'll get a response from her, and you'll be able to read part of it. Please remember Miss Lois and Louise House and Frankie Hyatt. 
uh, Brother Ted Rayleigh. Uh, Ted hadn't been able to be with us now in over, well over a year, and uh, Ted has gone down a lot in the last year or two. I would appreciate prayers for Mom. Uh, also, Greg's uh, brother-in-law, Tiny Tomlinson, and uh, Miss uh, Diane Dutton's mother, Nellie, I believe her last name is McGee, if I remember correctly, but uh, she is really struggling, gone down a lot just uh, recently. Uh, other things, Abby and Hunter's wedding uh, is on June the 5th. And, uh, you know, if you're going to the reception, please don't leave tonight till you sign that list. Uh, just sign the list if you're going to go to the reception, and they'll have an idea better of, uh, and let's not drag that out uh, right on up to the very day. Uh, so please sign the list that's on the board if you're going to stay for the reception. Don't have to sign the list if you're just going to the wedding, but if you're going to stay for the reception, please uh, sign that list. Our summer series begins two weeks from Wednesday night, and uh, I don't remember the order of speakers, but I know the first two speakers are Kirk Brothers and David Barker. Terry Whitmore told me that when David was a little boy, he was in her class at Carbon at uh, Curry, and said that uh, uh, when she heard he was a preacher, she said he can't be a preacher. He don't talk. <laughs> that he never talked, but he has made a great gospel preacher and very humble, and so I know you're going to enjoy, the, and I can't remember who the third one is, but uh, those first two weeks will be Kurt Brothers and uh, David Barker. And uh, our theme this year is Everyday Christianity from the Book of James. We'll be having 12 lessons, all from the Book of James this year. Uh, our meal on wheels will be Wednesday of this week, and... Uh, uh, if you can get with Sandra, you need any help right now? Everything's taken care of. And uh, so I don't know how much longer we'll be doing this into the summer, but we've been doing it over a year now, enjoying every minute of it. And uh, I think we've done a lot of good with it, and uh, it's been a blessing to a lot of people. And uh, so we're going to continue to do it for a while. Uh, but if you'd like to help with that and you've not had the privilege to do so, I'm sure there's a place. In fact, just somebody asked me today if there was a place that they could uh, play in that role. Thank you for being here. Let's all stand. If you've not had an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper, dismiss yourselves. We began to sing, and we hope that you'll be here on Wednesday night. Let's all stand. We do again thank Justin for that good lesson this evening. Uh, number 250. Number 250. We'll sing verses 1 and 2, and then Clyde Garrison will lead us in our dismissal prayer. How sweet, how heavenly is the light when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word when each can fill his brother's eye and compare. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord, and we just thank you for the many blessings of life that you give us each day. Lord, we thank you for the lesson we heard tonight, Lord. We pray we just take it to our hearts and lives, and Lord, that we live the Christian life that you'd have us to live. Lord, we thank you for this church here, Lord, and what it stands for, for the word of Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for Justin and his family, and Vance and his family, Lord, as they uh, teach us their lessons each week. And Pray for our elder decisions they make for this church, Lord, and they always make the right decisions for what this church stands for, Lord. Pray for our deacons, Lord, to be with them as they carry out the duties that they're assigned. Thank you for all the teachers here that teaches classes, Lord. Just be with them and give them the words that they need to teach. And Lord, we just pray for the whole congregation, Lord. It will always be a people that you'd have us to be. Lord, as we go through this coming week, Lord, pray that you'd watch.